can remember uh, a few years ago picking my grandson up from school. He may have been third or fourth grade. And when he came out, he said to me, Grandpa, the kids think it's funny that I don't have a dad. And, and indeed, uh, my grandson being raised by my daughter, single mom. And I said to him, you know, not everybody has a dad. Everybody has a father, that's how you get in this world. But he said, I told him that sometimes when you don't have a dad, God gives you a really cool grandpa. <laughs> now I think about back to the life when I was growing up. I think of two very important men in my life. One was my grandfather, actually my grandfather, my grandmother who raised me. And I also think of my Uncle David and his wife is here today. Uncle David passed on a few years back. But I, I think of those two guys as I grew up uh, who, uh, and, and to be quite honest, I always think of my grandpa and I think of my Uncle David and I always, I really looked up to them. Uh, even years later when I realized that they weren't as perfect as I thought they were when I was little, uh, they had some flaws that I was pretty sure I didn't want to copy. Uh, but I still like the idea that somehow I would have some of the best qualities of my grandpa and some of the best qualities of my Uncle David. Now, I even see that attitude in my own kids. Uh, I think back when I was uh, coaching an athletic director in a high school up in uh, Illinois, uh, my son was asked to do a chapel service one day, and he decided to come dressed as me. He wore coach's shorts, he had knee socks, back when he used to wear those long knee socks, and he had tennis shoes on, he had a coach's shirt, and he had a whistle. And I sat there and I couldn't help but wonder, is that what I really look like? Uh, but to him, that's exactly what I look like. I mean, I was his high school basketball coach. And apparently, apparently to everybody else, it was too, because he was really a big hit in chapel that day. Uh, now, this, this young teenager is now closing in on 50 years of age. He's married. He and his wife live about five, six minutes away from us, uh, close to his sister. And I really hope and pray even to this day that as my kids are closing in on the half century mark, that they would still have some reason to want to imitate me. Now today is Father's Day, and while I am going to speak kind of to the dads, I want you to understand I'm really talking to all of you who find yourself at different times in parenting situations. It could be your single mom, could be your single dad. It could be that you are, you know, the Brady Bunch, his, mine, and ours. It could be that you are some grandmas and grandpas, and we find that there are more and more grandmas and grandpas today who are involved in the raising of their grandchildren as well. But I want to talk about the responsibility that God lays out for us. But I'm going to preface that by saying, you know, being a dad today is not really that easy. In fact, there's not a whole lot in our culture uh, that encourages fathers to be good leaders in home. In fact, we don't really see it much on television because being a good dad on television doesn't make for much good comedy. Um, it's a lot funnier to see some sort of a doofus dad on television who's the butt of every joke. Uh, that's why we can't learn much about being a father from watching a sitcom. Uh, over the years, I, and I've been a father for a long time, and I know that being a father, you have to learn balance. You need to be a leader in your house without being a tyrant. Uh, you need to be firm without being uh, inflexible. You need to be strong without being overbearing. Uh, a father's job really is to develop character in his children. But fathers, here's the catch. Or I could say, moms, here's the catch. You can teach character, both good and bad, without even trying. I don't know if you know that. Uh, you can either be the primary person who develops good character, or it's also possible for you to develop a bunch of real characters. Uh, the question is, what kind of character would you like to develop? Now today we're going to take a look at a father-son relationship in the Bible. In fact, it's one of the oldest. It's the father and son, Abraham and Isaac. And uh, Abraham was a great man. Uh, he did many great things and God used him in a great many wonderful ways. But Abraham was not perfect. In fact, Abraham was far from perfect. 
I, I might add that everybody here reading the Bible that we have always kind of held up. I mean, I grew up on Sunday school stories. And so all the time I heard about how good Abraham was, how good Isaac was, how great Jacob was, how great all these people. And I wanted, and everybody said, well, we should grow up and be like them. I thought, I could never be like them. But when I finally decided I should start reading these stories all the way through, I thought, man, I am kind of like these guys. <laughs> this is a little bit of the good, bad, and the ugly. Now, even though he wasn't perfect, he was still God's man. And today I want to look at some events in his son's life that show you some of his father's influence. And again, I'd say dads and anybody else who's got themselves in a position of influence with children, I want you to think about a few things as you raise your children or you influence your children. Now, the, the backdrop of this story is that Abraham is chosen by God when he was a young man. He asked him to leave his home, move to a far distant land, not sure where he was going, but he gave him a bold promise. In fact, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, he said, I'll make you into a great nation and bless you and make you famous, and you're going to be a blessing to other people. Uh, he also says in Genesis 17, your descendants will be many nations. There will be kings that grow out of your family, and God will bless your descendants after you. Now, you also know the story that when Abraham and his wife Sarah got to be pretty old, probably in their 90s, they still hadn't had any children, at least not the way that God intended. And he told them, you're going to have a son. And you may remember that uh, Sarah laughed. And of course, they named their son Isaac, which means laughter, which in another way is God got the last laugh, didn't he? He said, you'll name him Isaac, and I'm going to confirm my covenant that I made with you with him. Now, if you fast forward a few years, Abraham has passed away. Isaac is a grown man. If you got your Bible, I'm going to pick up this story in Genesis chapter 26. Because there are three events in this chapter that help fathers, all of us, really to pass on good, good qualities to our children. Now, I almost call this message, rather than being Obed-Edom, which you're probably already wondering what on earth that is, I almost wanted to call this like father, like son, because we're going to start looking at Abraham and Isaac, and we'll get to Obed-Edom, whoever he is, a little bit later. But clearly, these principles apply to your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren, uh, whoever you have a, a chance to influence. But there are three things I want you to remember. And here's the very first thing. I think you got outlines in your worship folder. Is that, that you make sure that you give your children something to continue. Now, there was a famine, and Isaac was preparing to move when God tells him in verse 2. He said, uh, do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. I hereby confirm that I give all these lands to you and your descendants, just as I solemnly promised Abraham your father. I'll cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give you all these lands, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should, because that's basically the same set of promises that he had given to Isaac's dad back a long time ago, given to Abraham. Now, God started something in his life, that, in Abraham's life, that Isaac was able to continue in his life. Why? Because Abraham had been faithful to God, and now here comes along his son, who's also faithful to God. Now, I want to suggest to you that God wants to do the same thing in your life, that, so that he continue through you in the life of your children. Now, I'm not talking about that they pass on the family business, uh, or that you somehow get your kids to follow your career path. You know, being a pastor, I wouldn't wish that on any of my kids. Uh, but I am talking about a family tradition of sorts. It's kind of a tradition of character, a tradition of obedience, a tradition of faith. It's a, it's a tradition of identity. Now, in my family, there are only six of us right now. My wife, Nancy, myself, my son, Eric, and his wife, Cheryl, our daughter, Terry, and our grandson, Joshua. But in two weeks, I will be doing the wedding of my grandson. Little Joshy boy. Little Joshy boy is now 25, and he's going to add another person to our family, Christina. Now, we have always referred to ourselves as all the known Coles. We just don't know any other Coles except us. And, and so we're kind of an interesting group of people. If you hung around with all the known Coles long enough, you'd say, 
That's an interesting group of people. But it's kind of a, a, a matter of identity. Now, the same could be said of you. We're all the known whatevers. Now, uh, that's, there's something to be uh, about being able to say to your sons and daughters, look, this is who we are. Uh, these are the kind of choices we make as a family. Uh, this is the type of life we choose to lead. I, mean, I, I think back about my grandma and grandpa. There was never, ever a question of whether we were going to church. I did discover as I grew up, I got a little older, that the later I came in, it seemed like the earlier we went to church. <laughs> and my grandpa actually used to say uh, something about, uh, there, it's an awful dumb horse that doesn't learn from a beating. I think I was about 17 or 18 before I figured out who the old horse was, <laughs> the dumb horse was. In, in, in our family, there has never, ever been a question of whether we were going to church or not. You know, sometimes I pastored large enough churches where we had Saturday night service and we had multiple services on Sunday, but there was never, ever a question. And so there's a pattern that's been set in their lives. Now for three generations, and my grandson and his fiancée go to church that passed on. Now, in history, Abraham Lincoln, uh, when he was a little boy, his father, Thomas, moved the family uh, from Kentucky to Indiana. The reason was because he was strongly opposed to slavery, and slavery was not permitted in Indiana. Now, do you see the identity he passed on to his son Abraham? Uh, also, Martin Luther King Sr. Uh, took his son, Martin Luther King Jr., to buy shoes one day, and he was told that they would need to go into the back of the store in order to buy shoes. And Martin Luther King Sr. said, we either buy shoes out here in front or we don't buy shoes at all. Now, I don't know if they left that store that day with shoes or not, but uh, I sure it built a strong sense of identity in Martin Luther King Jr. How many of you remember who Kurt Warner is? Remember the name Kurt Warner? He, uh, NFL quarterback, uh, who took the Rams and the Cardinals to the Super Bowl. Uh, he and his family have an interesting tradition that's that every time they go out to a restaurant, he asks one of the kids to scan the restaurant and, and choose a table. And then their, that other family's tab is anonymously paid for by the Warners. Now, what kind of identity do you think Kurt Warner is passing on to his kids? And by the way, the identity I teach my kids is we always need to eat where the Warners eat. <laughs> But I got good news for the rest of the family that's here today. All the normal cults are paying for lunch, and don't you argue with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, fathers, make sure you have something of value to pass on to your children. I mean, make sure that your life begins something that God can reproduce in them, just like Abraham's heritage uh, of faith and obedience. But there's a second part to the story, and that is to, number two, be aware and help them be aware of your character flaws. Now, something very interesting happens again here in chapter 26, it's down in verse 6. It says, so Isaac stayed in Gerar when the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, Rebekah. He said, she is my sister. He was afraid to say she is my wife. Why? He thought, they're going to kill me because she's so beautiful. I read, I read this story so often. I'm thinking, if they're afraid they're going to kill him because it's his wife, and he says, but she's my sister, aren't they taking her anyway? I mean, either way, it's kind of a stupid story. Now, later, when uh, Abimelech the king finds out that Isaac had been dishonest, he was furious. Now, if this story sounds a little bit familiar to you, why is that? It's because his dad, Abraham, had done the very same stunt with his wife to the very same king, Abimelech. See, both men did it. Why? Because they were cowards. They did it because they had a lack of character. Both men showed a willingness to put their wives in harm's way just to save their, their hide. And both men were absolutely, positively wrong to do it. Now, Abraham was a man of God, and God used him, but that doesn't mean he was perfect. Isaac was a man of God, did great things for God, but that doesn't mean he was perfect either. 
And the same can be said for Moses and David and Peter and Paul and every last person you can find in the Bible. And guess what? Here's the unfortunate truth. It's the same for every father here. It's the same for every parent here. Your kids are likely to pick up some of your bad habits. Now, as a pastor, I don't have any <laughs> that I'd like to admit to. <laughs> now, we all got them. We all got them. They're likely to inherit some of your character flaws. Uh, and if they see you do cowardly things, guess what? They'll probably resort to cowardice somewhere along the line, too. If they see you respond to all kinds of challenges with a violent temper, you're, they're, you know, they see you rant and rave all the time, uh, when things don't go your way, chances are they'll pick up that habit as well. When I was a teacher, I always loved parent consultation days. You know why? Parents would walk in and I'd go, oh, that's why they're the way they are. <laughs> Didn't take long, you know, because the nut doesn't fall very far from the tree. But see, here's the problem. If you could fix your faults, you probably would. I mean, if you could get rid of your fear, if you could get rid of your worry, if you could get rid of your anxiety, all of your bad habits at once, you probably would do it. But you can't. And the reason is, is because we are not perfect. We are sinful human beings. So your kids are going to see you fail from time to time. Maybe they'll see you actually fail big time from time to time. But here's what you can do. You can be completely honest with your kids. You can talk to them about yourself. You can talk about your faults. I mean, you can say, for example, I struggle with my temper and I absolutely hate it. It, it hurts me in my job. It uh, hurts me in my marriage. It's not good for my health. Uh, it's a problem and I want to do everything I can to stop it. I want to make sure that you don't develop the same bad habits I do. Now, in my case, over, uh, actually, uh, Nancy and I are going to be married 50 years in uh, July. But I know over the years raising our kids and also spending time with my grandson, there have been different times when I have talked to them and pointed out certain things in my life that I don't necessarily like. And I've said to them, this is a battle that I lose far too often, but I, I'm praying all the time that you guys do your best with God's help not to do this. Now, now please understand, I am not saying that you should say to your kids, do as I say, not as I do. Not at all. Um, I'm talking about being transparent with your kids. Your weaknesses, your faults. I mean, imagine if Abraham had taken Isaac aside at some point and had said to him, Isaac, I, I brought shame to our family uh, when I lied to Abimelech and, and gave away your mother to him. I, I treated her with disrespect. I put her in harm's way. This is not what a man of honor does. Don't follow my example, learn from my mistakes instead. So your kids are gonna pick up some of your bad habits. There's no doubt about it. When Josh used to come and spend time with his grandma and grandpa and we'd send him back, my daughter would often call and say, Josh is home, he's speaking grandpa again. <laughs> and you know, he'd be in the store and he'd see a little baby, he says, oh look at that cute little nipper. Now where did he learn that? Yeah, from Grandpa. I'm not saying that's a bad habit. That's a pretty good habit. But uh, be wise enough to recognize your faults. Be transparent enough to admit them to your kids so you can help them. Now, here's the third thing you want to do, and that's to make sure that they also see you do some things right. Uh, now, towards the end of chapter 26, Isaac had moved to another place, and the Bible says in verse 25 that God appeared to him, spoke to him again. And part of what he says in verse 25 is this, that Isaac built an altar there and worshiped God. Now the question is, why did he decide to do that? Well, it's pretty simple. It's because it's something that he had seen his father do many times before. If you go back to chapter 12, it says, Abraham built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord. A little further in, in Genesis chapter 12, it says he built another altar dedicated it to the Lord. Chapter 13, there was a place that Abram built an altar, and there he worshiped the Lord. In chapter 13, there he built another. So Abraham seemed to be in a pattern of he was always building an altar and giving thanks to God. So what he was doing was giving his son an example of spirituality to follow. His custom was to celebrate and worship God at every key event in his life. And Isaac knew this. 
He'd heard the stories. He'd witnessed it firsthand with his dad. And so I, I'd say to all of you men, actually all of us here today, you're here today. <laughs> That's a good thing. It's a good, it's a good thing, dads are here today, even if you got nagged into coming. It's kind of like Mother's Day, when mom says, oh, please come one time. It's still good that you're here with your kids. You're setting an example for your family. And by nature, and I, I'm speaking just purely as a man, uh, by nature we tend to be kind of reserved about spiritual things. Uh, we're kind of reserved about our personal life. Uh, our relationship with God also, often we say, well, it's just kind of between me and God. Now, I'm going to confess that even as a pastor, I sometimes am not as transparent with my spiritual life as I probably should be. But I under, because I understand sometimes it's not the easiest thing to talk about spiritual matters, especially to strangers and sometimes even with our own family. But I want to tell you, it's necessary to talk spiritual things with your family. Uh, the it, it, reason is because they see your faults, you can't hide them, but you also need to let them see your strengths. Uh, make sure they have an example to follow. And the best way to do that is to take them along with you on life's journey. What I'm saying is just give kids an opportunity to see your faith in action. Give them a way to give them a hands-on experience. I think back in the 1970s when Nancy and I moved to Hong Kong, you know, where I went as an educational missionary, one of the great things was to be able to take our kids along. And our kids were exposed to that in some of the cool things we did. Uh, I, we've taken our grandson with us to Angola Prison on two different occasions. And our grandson, who's biracial, is like, what a better place to take a biracial grandson to a prison where he can learn from other godly black men. Could you find a better place to take him? And even to this day when I'm back down there, the guys all say, how's Little Doc doing? And uh, they, they wonder about him. And uh, I have an email waiting for me to read today from, from uh, one of my good friends down there, Hayward. And he's all anxious to hear about how Little Doc and the wedding are going. But they were great influences on him. Uh, so give them opportunities, hands-on opportunities. And see, the truth is, whether we like it or not, dads, moms, grandparents, they really want to be like you, whether they say so or not. I mean, I taught high school long enough where a lot of kids said, boy, the last thing I want to do is grow up to be like mom or dad. <laughs> Guess what? You will. <laughs> I've done enough marriage counseling, and I do this circumflex family model, and what it shows is your family of origin and, and your, what your couple relationship is. And I will tell you that anytime you get married, whenever stress enters your relationship, you will revert back to exactly how you were raised. Nancy and I are polar opposites. I mean, her family, everybody's business is everybody's business. <laughs> you probably know well enough that your business was your business. You deal with it. Now, that's kind of the way you revert, unless you say, no, I'm going to change. With kids, you're going to grow up and be just like your mom and dad, whether you like it or not. So parents, give them something good to follow. Uh, yeah, character is hard to develop, uh, but, the, but you, if you'll pay the price in your life to be the person you want to be today, guess what, you're not going to have to pay so many prices a little bit later in life. Now, in closing, I want to share something that I found in, in Bible study um, it's probably a little over a month ago, I think, and, uh, and I read through the Bible every year, with the exception of the last few years where I follow a different plan, so I'm reading half the Bible one year and half of the next year. And this year, uh, I came across First Sam or Second Samuel, and you see the question, why did God bless the house of uh, Obed-Edom? It, it's a little-known man in the Bible. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 10 to 12, it says, David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. Now, Gath sounds familiar. That's where Goliath was from. So the ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. Then King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of the Lord. So David went there and brought the ark from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with great celebration. Now, you might say, well, who is this Obed-Edom? I've never heard of this guy. And why should we even think about being like him? 
Well, I think it's because of his life choices, and his life choices led to blessings not only for himself, but also for his family. So I had to do a little bit more study about Obed-Edom. Uh, he, he is first mentioned in, in Samuel uh, just after the death of Uzzah. Now, you all know who Uzzah is, right? Well, Uzzah was the guy when the Ark of the Covenant, they carried on a pole, they kind of started, they started to come up a wagon, and Uzzah reached out and touched the Ark, and God killed it. That's a scary story, huh? That's because there were laws against touching the Ark of the Covenant. Well, as a result, they decided to take the ark and put it into Obed-Edom's house. Now, he must have been a man of faith uh, to uh, allow something in his home, especially after he probably just witnessed good old Uzzah biting the dust when he touched the ark. Well, it stayed with him for three months. And the Lord, it says, blessed everything in his house, everything in his family. But now David decides finally he's going to move that ark back to Jerusalem this time he's going to do it the right way. And Obed-Edom now has a choice. He can either stay where he was and live off of his past relationship with God, or he could move with the ark, staying in God's presence and staying in relationship with God. The, uh, he has this great desire for the Lord, so he moves. And the Lord, from that time on, you can read about it in 1 Chronicles, how God seems to bless everything he touched. He became a gatekeeper in the temple. He was a musician. He was a doorkeeper to where they kept the ark in the Holy of Holies. And God just blessed him and promoted him. Uh, if you read the Psalms, you see that some of them are written by David, but you'll also see that some of them are written by a guy named Asaph. And like Asaph, he, he was with Asaph where he was the chief musician. He also had 68 associates who worked for him and were also blessed. Uh, God gave him eight sons. It doesn't say anything about his daughters. Don't get worried about that because that's the Old Testament. Women didn't count the Old Testament, really. But he had children and grandson to the point where it says that God blessed him and all 62 of his male descendants. Now, my guess is if God blessed him and all of his 62 male descendants, every last family that those 62 men touched, God blessed as well. So open Eden by his faith and by his attitude and by his actions, really created and left a legacy for many generations to come. That's again why I'd say dads, moms, grandparents, aunts, uncles, any of you who find yourself in a position to influence children, make it your objective to give your kids an identity to continue. You know, be transparent with them again about your weaknesses so that they can learn from your mistakes and they can overcome it. And always give them a godly example to follow. Share your strengths with them. Show what those strengths are uh, by letting them see you in action. But most of all, let them know the place that God has in your life. There is a, uh, an old contemporary song that is kind of the theme song for our family. We sing it almost at every family gathering we have. And it has a line that always sticks with me, and I'll leave, it, leave you with it today. It says, may the footsteps that we leave lead them to believe. May all who come behind us find us faithful. May God bless each and every one of us as we have an opportunity to minister to children in our lives.